This is the 911 Talk Podcast, episode 83, for Monday, May 7th, 2012. Welcome to this edition of E911 Talk with your host, Mark Fletcher, Pilot Line Manager for Emergency Services at Avaya. Now, here's Fletch. Earlier this year on March 21st, an incident occurred in the Manhattan School District that prompted a call to 911. Now, this wasn't Manhattan, New York. This particular Manhattan was a small village in Will County, Illinois, about 50 miles southwest of Chicago. Apparently what happened was two Will County kindergartners decided to take a leave of absence and walked off the school grounds. 911 was called, but instead of reaching the Lincoln Way Public Safety Communications Center over in Frankfurt, the call was routed to an emergency call center in Canada. Now the immediate question was, how could this happen? with the initial suspect being the new voice over IP system installed last December by Broadvox. Well, as usual, the press sees E911 failure and voice over IP in the same sentence, and they immediately start to draw conclusions that the two are related. Manhattan Police Chief Howard Martin responded, it had nothing to do with us, it was a problem at the school. Ultimately, the children were found. However, it was reported that due to the Canadian routing that occurred, Emergency response was delayed by five minutes. Additional comments made by the Chicago Sun-Times reported that after the Broadvox system was installed, it was checked and appeared fine. However, after the incident, the system was corrected so that any future 911 calls would route locally. The initial knee-jerk response is, voice over IP is not compatible with E911. Wrong. The technology used by the person making the call whether it's digital, analog, wireless, or even voice over IP, actually has little to no bearing on the network processing an E911 call. What does matter, however, is how the system is interconnected with the PSTN. Even then, it's not so much as how, but by who that connection is made. Traditional carriers delivering legacy circuits are well interconnected geographically with the 911 selected routers. But as businesses flatten, consolidate, and extend, a voice over IP trunking solution becomes more and more attractive. And additionally, SIP trunking offers additional savings as well as the consolidation benefits. The problem, however, with SIP trunking is that it can be located anywhere. It's not bound by the geographical boundaries of the PSTN. This makes E911 more difficult to deal with as the location of your trunks may not be local to the location of your users. Now this completely breaks the legacy E911 model used today in North America. Fear not, there is a fix. In the past, we've talked about voice over IP positioning centers, also known as VPCs. Think of the VPC as a new type of carrier that specifically deals with E911 call traffic. It's the VPC's responsibility to maintain connectivity to each E911 service area and provide their customers with proper routing for emergency calls. Now, just like any network transporting any data, routing rules and instructions must be established. For voice over IP emergency calls to a VPC, the calling number, or ANI, is used as a routing reference against a pre-provisioned database. This routing mechanism is identical to the E911 selective router network, with the exception that it covers a much wider service area, typically all of North America. So based on this, we can shift the blame for this particular call to the VPC, right? No, not really. In today's legacy analog-based 911 routing, calls going to a selective router make it there in some instances without the proper ANI. We know that it's a 911 call, we just can't confirm its origin. So do we just not process the call? Of course not. The call is what is known as default routed to a designated PSAP where it's presented as either an ANI fail or a no data call. This is a key indicator to the emergency call taker that they need to establish the location of the caller through a verbal inquiry. Now back to our friends in Manhattan, Illinois. I'll speculate on what happened here and openly admit that I don't have all the details. Most likely what occurred, based on the facts that we do have, is that the call to 911 was presented to the VPC. For some reason, the ANI or caller ID did not exist in the VPC database and the VPC probably default routed that call to an emergency call response center for manual handling. Now, although this did cause a delay in the emergency response, it was the VPC that was at fault, right? Well, most likely, the answer to that is also no. 
When you look at an implementation of the D911 service, there are several important steps that you have to consider. First is how the system will operate. What exactly happens when a station dials 911, who's notified, and where the call terminates? The second, and just as important as the first, is what routing will take place within the carrier network you're presenting that call to. Doesn't matter if it's a legacy analog network, digital PRI network, or even a new modern voice over IP network. If the carrier doesn't have the routing instructions, the call cannot be completed. And therefore, on a 911 call, would be default routed, or even worse, incorrectly routed based on invalid data. So let's step back and look at this and try to establish how and why this happened. Again, based on the facts, I'm not sure you can blame the school, Broadbox, or the VPC carrier. More than likely, the implementation was at fault by either not testing properly or not taking 911 into consideration at all. You need to keep this in mind when you're looking at your E911 solution for your enterprise. And when you're attending the great E911 debate at IAUG in Boston on Sunday, May 20th. You see the technology exists to deal with today's highly mobile and nomadic workforce. The knowledge to implement properly is what is often in question. You don't have to become a 911 expert to purchase a 911 solution, just like you don't have to be a mechanic to purchase a car. You should know, however, how many wheels to expect the car to have, and you probably should know how to drive. I asked Bill Sveen, Vice President of Corporate Strategy for 911 ETC and one of Avaya's select product partners to comment. Bill stated that, quote, the implementation process is key to the successful routing and delivery of a 911 call. Ensuring that numbers are properly provisioned within the VPC database is essential, and testing should be thoroughly completed before going live. The technology is available today to properly route 911 calls, whether an organization is utilizing TDM or IP and SIP. It's the front-end provisioning of the solution that should be meticulously and professionally handled in order to avoid an outgoing 911 call with no location information attached." Unquote. So as you can see, implementing E911 just takes a little common sense and general knowledge that helps you dig through the rhetorical techno babble that's out there. I look forward to seeing many of you in Boston at the great E911 debate, where I'll be joined by Bill of 911 ETC, Nick of Red Sky, Lev from 911 Enable, and Tim from Conveyance Systems. Be sure to check out this great session. If you need more details, go to www.iaug.org. You've been listening to the E911 Talk Podcast with your host, Mark Fletcher, Product Line Manager for Emergency Services at Avaya. E911 Talk is a weekly podcast available on sites like this, as well as iTunes, and is available free of charge. If you have any comments or questions, you can email Fletch at FletcherM at Avaya.com. That's Fletcher, the letter M, at Avaya.com. Be sure to listen in next week for more informative topics on E911. 911, the line is recorded. What is the exact location of your emergency?